happens before it's time, right? Mr. Ransford. In fact, Dr. Ransford. Annette Abbey. He's in the house. And we all know this gentleman right from the circles of football, right? And when we talk about the Ghana Football Association, the list will never be complete without mentioning this name. Randy Abbey. He's my guest right here in the African history class. And we're about to have a very beautiful conversation. Mm, Dr. Abbey, welcome to the studio. I am happy to have you and thank you so much for accepting to talk to us. Well, good to be here. It feels great to be here. <laughs> I was reading about you and there were yes. some things that came up and I was like, whoa, these, all these things are they true? Did you ever work with uh, Joy FM and were you ever an MP? No, not true. Wow. I have never, never worked with the, um, with the multimedia group mm. and I've never been a member of parliament. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, interesting. Yeah. I was reading about you and it says, oh, 10 facts you never knew about Randy Abbey. I was seeing <laughs> things like uh, you were uh, an MP somewhere along the line. I said, when was he an MP and I never knew? <laughs> and, uh, and that you even worked with um, um, Joy FM on, on the eyewitness news. I know eyewitness news <laughs> is not something that is synonymous with Joy FM, but with City FM. So you've never been on radio. I have I have been on radio. I actually started on radio. Wow! I, I started on uh, Radio Gold. Wow! Yes, that's that's my uh, media uh, genesis. It was actually Radio Gold. So wow. from Radio Gold to to Choice FM, and then initially, uh, incidentally, whilst I was at Choice FM, my first uh, experience with TV was TV Three. Wow! Yes, whilst I was at Choice FM, so. Uh, your uncle Frank Cry and I. Mm. So Yao um, came in first, and uh, that's when the Malaysians were here. Yes, right. And so they had um, what they call the Worthington Cup. Mm. I think that that's what is called a Carabao today. Mm -hmm. So they had the rights. Yes. And so uh, they brought us in uh, on contract. And so Yao, um, if Yao hosts maybe today's games, I'll be the analyst. And then for tomorrow's games, I'll host Yao, be the analyst. And so uh, that's what we did, and that's how we made uh, extra money. Wow! Because <laughs> wow. we're paid per, you know, per per, per uh, session. Oh! You know, so whilst we were on uh, Choice FM, was, we we're also doing TV Three oh. um, as as a, as part time. Interesting. Yeah, more of our contract stuff. Yeah. Interesting. So so my first foray was in radio, Radio Gold. Mm -mm. Yes. Did you ever try to be an MP? No. I've never. never. I've never. Interesting. Yeah. And you went to Accra Academy, correct? Yes. Wow. Yes. And you have a doctorate degree from yes. Switzerland. Yes. Wow. Now, walk me through your academic journey. <laughs> uh, that's quite interesting. Um, okay, so I, I'll try and summarize it because it's mm. a, quite a, a long, lengthy one. Mm. And so um, I um, started off uh, mm. when I was, I was quite young. I had to go stay with my auntie, my mom's um, um, older sister, mm. who's um, uh, passed on now, Mrs. Jemima Lamte. Um, I was extremely young, so there were many people who thought that she was my mother. You know, that's when you could count the number of houses there, very early 70s. Mm. You know, so I started off with the, there was a a nursery school run by a, a Catholic nun, a, a white lady. And then I went to a school called uh, Calvary International. Um, it's moved to a new place, but then we were at the old uh, 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 place. And then um, after class three, I had to move to um, Happy Home Academy, um, Atiko Junction. It's still there, but the school looks smaller. Smaller, okay. Uh, than, than, than it was. Uh, so. Uh, that had to do with my basic um, education. And then for secondary school, incidentally, I missed out um, two years mm. in the course of secondary school for health reasons. And then um, I had to sit home for a year to re-sit maths. You know, my first time all level, I had a seven in maths. Oh, wow. And, you missed and it. I wanted to read economics in sixth form, and mm. I couldn't. So I had to reset maths. So I sat home for a whole year just to reset maths, and then I had a five, so I could go on and uh, uh, read economics. That's, then, that's A-level, right? Yeah, then, yeah. Uh, yes, then I had a, 
lost that two years out, out of ill health and all that. So finished with the A-level, did national service. And, you know, along the line, we had these um, family shops at Tudu and Okanshi. So whilst we were in school, we'll still go uh, there during the holidays, you know, and then we go there, we make some money. And as young people, uh, we found it quite interesting. So at the point, you know, I, I really, uh, whilst my mom, my grandmother, everybody was giving pressure, I mean, continuing to the university, I also thought that, look, um, we, we were making money, <laughs> you know, at the family uh, shops and right. all that. So, mm. you know, just stay there. And my father kept uh, pestering me. She thought, he thought that, look, I was just wasting my time. Uh, that's not a place for me. I needed to go back to school. So reluctantly, you know, I said, okay, I wanted to study public relations. To be honest with you, I didn't know what it meant. I see. It was, I just found the name interesting. It was just something that I thought was in the interesting and I wanted to do. And I thought that it was also something to get my dad off of me. <laughs> Those days you had to sit an entrance exam mm. um, for GIJ. Okay. You know, and that was the institution where we could read public relations at the time. So I remember the, uh, I think it was where Beneza, at that place, that's where you see the entrance exam. So I think, Kwame Sevaka and I. Oh, I see. Yeah, wow. I think for, for about two occasions, mm. um, they didn't pick us. I see. <laughs> you know, so one time my dad came and, you know, I said, I don't know, well, they say to enter the place, you need to know somebody <laughs> and all those things, somebody there. And uh, Ben Efsin mm. had started a program at Radio Gold. And he was one of my dad's young friends. Oh, okay. And then my dad's friend and church mate was uh, Mr. Banson, who was the father of Fifi Banson. Mm. So then we had uh, Mauko Afajino, who was a lecturer at GIG. Mm. But they had a program on Radio Gold um, called, uh, I'll try and get a name. It was mm. a Saturday show with mm. Captain Sou and others, mm. you know. Mm. And so the thing was that I should go and see um, Mauko Afajino. Uh, to look at the possibility of he helping with um, some admission. I'm sure Marco will be surprised to hear this. Mm. And so that said that, oh, I've spoken with my friend, uh, Mr. Banson. So go see his son, mm. who's at Radio Gold, Fifi Banson. It was like 96, thereabout. And then he will introduce you to Mr. Fajino. So I got to Radio Gold. It was a weekday, I mm. think a Monday or something. Mm. So I got in the morning. When I got there, I was told that, oh, Fifi has come to do... Uh, a segment on the morning show and that he's done. Mm. So he's left for where they live, an apartment at the Biokosha. Right. So I was showed the place and then I went there. So I went there, I met him and I knew him as Peter Banson. I didn't know him as Fifi Banson. So I didn't know it was the same person. Okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I remember I met him. Then I met Kwame Sifakai there. Mm. Uh, he was also living there. Mm. And then the late Benji Kumasa. Yeah. He yes. was also there. Mm. And I remember that day, mm. you know, so I was with uh, Fifi. We were arguing and all that. I remember his, uh, his then girlfriend visited mm. with uh, Banku and Okru. You know, I was quite hungry. <laughs> so that food really helped. Mm. Then around about uh, 2 o'clock, he said, look, he has a 3 p.m. show. Mm. And we had been arguing and chatting. Mm. And the reason I went there I've been forgotten. Was even relegated to the background. <laughs> oh, that was for Marco. We can only see him on a Saturday. <laughs> so around 2.30, he says, I'm going to do my show. Mm. Let's walk to the place. So we went to Radio Gold. Mm. So I sat at the reception to wait for him. The whole intent was for me to be introduced to Marco uh, Afajino mm. to help with my GIJ mm -hmm. uh, 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 stuff. So I was sitting at the reception waiting for Fifi. And... Then he comes and says that this was around three o'clock. He says that oh, his guests for the show mm. have not turned up. Mm. Then he says that about yourself, we did the house, you they talk plenty. I see. You they hear plenty, they argue plenty. <laughs> uh, would you like to uh, go on there? Yeah. And I was like, ah, really? Uh, what are you discussing? Mm. Then he told me was what he was going to discuss. Mm. I said, okay, give me an A4 sheet and a pen. Mm. So he gave me the A4 sheet and a pen. He had told me what I was going to discuss. So I scribbled down a few things. I said, let's go. So we went into the studio. And he introduced me as uh, 
one of the regular callers and it's brought me into the studio. Wow. Meanwhile, I'd never called into wow. this program. <laughs> I never. And like I said, I went there for a completely different. Yes. Yes. And at that point, I had mm. never thought about being a journalist. Mm. I'd never thought about being in the media, being on radio or anything. You know, so we went on the show and I, I was enjoying myself. Mm. So right when we finished, it was a one-hour program, three to four. His producer then was uh, uh, my, my, Tony Usuamofa. He's passed on now. Mm. You know, great chap. Just when we finished the show, I turned and I saw two men at the entrance, mm. the, the entrance into the studio. Mm. And I later found out that one was the late Bafu Boni. Bafu Boni, wow. He was a general manager. A great man. And then mm. the other was... Uh, we call him Bingo. Mm. Do you remember that advert, Dad Wapa? Yes, I do. Uh -huh. I do so the Bingo, in it, right? Bingo was the business development manager. Okay. You know, <laughs> so both of them, it's a young man. Mm. Who are you? Where are you from? Mm. You know, we're getting a lot of calls. People listening to you. Wow. And I told them, so oh, can you come off in? I wow. said, yeah, I don't have a problem. I can wow. come. They said, no, come off in. We're hearing, we're getting a lot of calls and people are saying very nice things about you. Wow. And that's how it started. Woo. So I never, ever dreamt of, thought about, intended to do anything, you know. So that's how it started. Mm. And then from there, uh, we'll be there arguing. Apparently, Babu was um, <laughs> listening and all that. And then one day he calls me and says that, oh, Mr. Ernest Thompson has started um, a, a talk show, mm -hmm. uh, Critical Analysis. And we're going to discuss something about the Keta C Defense Project. And they needed a lay person. So in that parliament, this should be around 1997. Mm. So in that parliament, I think there was a squadron leader, so, so, right. so the panel was going mm -hmm. to be squadron leader, so, and then the Honorable Kwamna Battels, who was the minority uh, person on uh, works and housing, mm. you know. And then Professor Mausi Dake, the late. Wow, wow. You know, it was about the Ketasi Defense Project. Mm. So Baba calls me and says, you, Yes, I've been listening to you arguing with your colleagues and all that about all manner of issues. We are looking for an outsider mm. for this show, Mr. Ernest Thompson. And we had been watching Mr. Ernest Thompson um, uh, do a talking point and all those. And I started this show. Then look at these people you're talking about. And mm. I'm supposed to go sit on a panel My God. with them. Ooh. There was no Mr. Google at the time. <laughs> so what could I do? Mm went into the newsroom at Radio Gold. Mm. So, you know, this stack of newspapers and had to go through the newspapers looking for anything about the KTAC Defense Project. You know, got it, scribbled down a lot of points. I was there till about past midnight, mm. you know, before I left, went home early morning, I was at a place. So I got there, then Mr. Ernest Thompson didn't know me. Mm. <laughs> he already knew me then. Mm. And so I got in there, and here were the squadron leaders, so the stalwarts, uh, the Honorable Kwamna Battles, um, squadron leader, so, and then this boy, you know. So, in fact, the discussion went on for 20 minutes, mm. as if I didn't exist, mm. you know. Wow. And then... Uh, Mr. Destopsi says, oh, oh, we also have with us uh, uh, Randy Abbey, yes. uh, who is also a member of the public <laughs> and is here, he's going to give us. So then he says, okay, you've been listening to uh, the experts speak about the issue, so um, uh, what can you tell us? Yeah. Mm. And I said, well, this is the golden opportunity. Wow. So all the research I'd done overnight and everything mm. started. Mm. And you know what? Based mm. on the research I did, mm. I could tell what Squadron Leader Su had said. Wow. On this issue. Mm. What Honorable Kwamna Batels had said. Mm. What Professor Mousy Dake had said. Wow. And I kept referring to them and quoting what they had said. Wow. And all that. So now I caught everybody's attention. Interesting. And then I became an integral part of the discussion. Wow. And uh, wow. <laughs> and that was and that was it. But were you scared at the beginning? I mean, meeting all these. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 mere fact that I was going to go on that show. Mm. And these were the people who were going to be on the panel. You know, if I, uh, Mr. Ernest Thompson, a lawyer, mm. I knew about him. <laughs> I'd seen him on TV. You know, I'd never <laughs> met him personally. Yes. Uh, squadron leader, so mm -hmm. I'd read about him. Mm -hmm. I watched him on TV, 
Honorable Kwame Na Bartels, mm. same. Mm. I mean, uh, um, 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 uh, Professor Mousy Dake. What? You know, I keep reading about what they talk about in the newspapers and all that. I've never had opportunity of even uh, standing by them. What? And here I was. An A-level graduate. Yes, just has to go sit down <laughs> with them in the is studio, you know? FM. And so uh, that's that's where the the non-sports side of me mm. also started. And that's why I give a lot of credit to uh, uh, Babo mm. and then uh, Phoebe Banson as well. Interesting. And, uh, interestingly, close 1997, just before 98 will start, mm. then Yampo Fankra also told me that, look, uh, I, I'm just alone at choice, and it's just me, the workload is a lot. I've told Tommy and the other people, Mr. White, that, look, we need help. Uh, two or three people have come. Uh, Tommy is not impressed with them. So you can come if Tommy likes you. I mean, that's fine. So I said, okay. I'd also heard about a lot about Tommy and I'm forcing, I've listened to him. Mm. I've never seen him. Mm. So, and I don't know why these things always happen on a Monday. Mm. So Monday morning, I get to um, <laughs> Choice FM. Mm. And as this happened, my mom, she always buys newspapers. Mm. And so I cultivated the habit of reading papers wow. from when I was young. It's my mother. She always buys newspapers. What's her name? Is she still alive? No. She died exactly 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, Elizabeth Esimens Manyan. Wow. Yeah, she passed on 10 years, exactly 10 years ago. Oh, a Fante woman? Yes, from oh. Cape Coast, yes. Okay, yes, so you yes. come from a Fante background as well? Yes, my mom. Mm. My dad girl, my mom Fante. Mm. You know. So, that morning, um, at the taxi rank at La Paz, I bought a daily graphic. And then I was reading. Then back the sports page, I was reading, and it was something about... Um, um, this American uh, sprinter, the lady uh, who later had problems with drugs. Drugs, yes, yes, yes. yes. I know who you're talking yes, about. So her exploits, yes, so I read about mm, it. Mm. So I got to choice, and yeah, I was going on the show. So Tommy, Uncle Tom was uh, uh, behind the console like you. So one of the microphones like this, and mm. you had to stand, mm. you know, where the newscasters would sit and mm -hmm. read the news. Mm -hmm. So I had to stand, and yeah, I was seated. Mm. And so yeah, I would raise the story, and then I'm also supposed to to, to analyze. And that was how Mr. Tommy Anamfosin was going to assess me wow. for just five minutes. Wow. You know, so the first thing I asked was about uh, the lady, the sprinter. Yes. And yes. that's what I had read mm -hmm. in the newspaper oh that I bought. God. You mm -hmm. know, so like they say, like, I told lie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then uh, I went waxing lyrical and all that. So wow. I finished, it was about seven minutes. Mm. And then Uncle Tom just muted the mic and said, um, can you wait for me? I said, yes, sir. Wow. So I waited. Then he finished the morning show at 9 a.m. Mm. So he came out. He said, oh, where is he? So I came. So he yes, Randy. Um, I like you. Wow. Um, I think that you have something. Wow. Um, I want to give you a job. Mm. I said, oh, cool. He says, okay. I want to give you a job. I want to work with you. Do you want to work with me? I said, yes. Then he calls Mr. Edward Fachi, who was then like that mean. Is he still boss. alive? I don't know. I need to Edward find Fachi, out. Yes. yes. I remember Edward so Fachi. So he called <clears throat> Mr. Edward Fachi and said, give him a contract. Wow. Yes. And so Mr. Edward Fachi then wrote the contract for me. And I signed immediately. Wow. <laughs> you know, so then I started work with uh, uh, a choice of him. But were you so, employed by Radio Gold or you were just a panelist? No. I was there mm. and oh, would um, do the letter for you, would do this. And I was there and they were using me for all manner of things, <laughs> you know. So I was there for over a year, and I was doing virtually everything, mm. you know. Huh? But they had not given me an appointment letter, mm. although I'd done over a year. So it was easy. I didn't have to think twice mm -hmm. when the um, offer from uh, Uncle Tom uh, came up. So how, how much was the salary? Yes, I remember it was um, three... Then it was three hundred. This and is three FM. Three hundred and fifty thousand. Three hundred and fifty thousand. Then so, so this should be like uh, December of ninety seven. Mm. Yes, uh, wow. because uh, the first major thing I dealt with was uh, Burkina ninety eight. So wow. this must be ninety seven mm -hmm. uh, December. And so you're paid uh, three hundred thousand at the end of a month. Then the fifty thousand is given as a transport allowance after two weeks. Yes. Uh, I don't know what that will will mean in today's uh, 
you know, but that, that that's, was... That's less than 400 yeah. Ghana cities. Okay, so that was the salary <laughs> then. And then I think, yeah, I was on 400. And wow. I was on 350. Mm. You know, so <laughs> that, was, that, that was really the, 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 the salary then. Who yeah. was your father? What did he do? What was his occupation? All right. Okay, so my father has also passed on as 11 years now. He did mm. his turn last year. So um, SLK Abe was the managing director of State Farms. Um, and... Uh, um, in 1982, right, he became a victim of the revolution mm. uh, when, when those things happened. So it was at the N uh, National Reconciliation uh, Commission, you know. So uh, that's what he did. As a young person, my dad was drafted into the army when he was 16 for the oh, Second World War. Wow. When he was 16. Second World War? Yes, when he was wow. 16. And so after the war, they were then, you know, uh, decommissioned, so to speak. So you are the son of a war veteran? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So uh, for those who know me, they know that uh, all my father's activities, I hold them at the VAG, uh, the VAG clubhouse. And wow. he was very active mm. in the act activities of a, a VAG. So it was after this military service and everything that he decided to go back to school. Mm. So when my father even went to KNUST, he had my um, eldest brother. He, he, he was a family man before he even went to KN UST. Wow. Yeah, so went to KN UST and then uh, did uh, quite a number of postgraduate studies in the, in the States, you know. And so he started um, from a, a clerical rank and mm. ended up as a managing director. So we were living at um, Akukofutu. Mm. It's, it's no longer there. That's where we're living mm. um, until... Um, 1982, when um, he, he was arrested, yes. Oh, he was arrested? Yes, 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 yes. 1982? Yes. What happened to him? These were the days of Rollins. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. So that's why I said he was at a national reconciliation. Oh. Yeah. 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 So what happened? Why was he arrested? What was the reason? Well, um, I think that it had to do with this PDC, CDR, work-related issues, enemy or revolution, anti-revolution, those things. Uh -huh. But there were a lot of crazy stuff going on around the time yeah so uh he became a victim and i was i was quite young i i think i was in class four mm. uh, yes around then i was i was i was around class four so i really didn't understand what was happening and my father really never um uh, spent any time discussing that with me um and as a result of that i spent um, almost all my life with my maternal side my mother, my grandmother, my aunties. When well, he so, was arrested? Yes. Wow. And, and even after that, you know. Wow. But it was only when mm. my father realized that I had uh, decided to take, um, um, tread on a path in, in the media, that mm. he decided to now sit with me to then uh, speak to me about what happened, showed me documentation and all that. So, wow. in fact, uh, when he was going before the NRC, I was supposed to go with him mm. then he had the dates mixed up so he gave me the wrong date mm. when he realized that it was that date i'd already i was already on air mm. on, on metro oh you know and so i couldn't go with him wow but uh when they were reporting it my friends when they reported uh his appearance that they made sure that they put a line which says that oh, <laughs> he's the father of uh, randy abby on metro tv this is 3fm <laughs> you know? so, so so that's that's the bill with my dad yes what did he do uh, do as in why was he arrested what was the reason i think he had to do with uh, workplace issues you know that was when you had um uh a lot of cadres and revolution people who were who had also formed the uh, workplace uh, things and so i think that uh, they thought that he, he perhaps was anti-revolution or something you know and so uh, they really did a lot of things um, up there and that's what led to to the issue what were the consequences what did he go through oh i mean he was there you know at that time you were just there and according to him i mean uh, they'll call people out. You just don't get to see people again. And wow, yeah, I think when he got to his stand, um, according to him, uh, the late Mr. Nitamkwa was around or something, and um, he then asked why he was there, and and that led to, you know, his release. But of course, um, he had lost the job. He has lost. He had lost uh, his place and all that. He had to start all over again. I mean, he lost a lot. Wow. You know, how you had to start all over again. But what like did... I said, I was extremely uh, young. You know, my dad's last. Mm. Yes. Oh, wow. So, yes. Was he rich? I, I, he wasn't rich, but I was comfortable. 
I mean, he was comfortable. He he made sure that all his kids were were taken care of. He took care of his kids, and uh, everybody around him was was comfortable. He was a he was a managing director, so he was a big man then. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. but I would not say that. I would not. I would not say he was rich, but mm. um, he could take care of all his responsibilities, including uh, um, those of his uh, nephews and nieces and all that. Wow! Mm. Wow! What was his name? Samolai Kwashiabi, Esokiabi. So a lot of his friends called him Sam. 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 Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now he wanted you to go to GIJ. In fact, you he wanted to go to GIJ. He didn't. I yes. said I wanted yes. to study. P. I just mm. wanted to throw him off. So what came to my mind? I said it. You know, but perhaps I was being prophetic. Wow. <laughs> wow. Did you get there? No, I didn't. I, I did it. Uh, I did it. And so, you know, so incidentally, <laughs> yeah. you know, later on, mm. I then realized that, look, uh, especially for my mother and my grandmother, they had pushed me. They wanted me to continue. They knew that I had what, you know, it took to, to get there. And I, I really didn't want to, you know. And then there was this incident. There was a day at the main gate of the Accra Sports Stadium. Mm. Okay. Then we met uh, Brother Fu. So I think I was in the company of some of, the, some of my colleagues. So it must be Fifi Bansin, I'm sure maybe Maurice Kwanza and a few others. Mm. So we met um, Moses Farmwini, who was a lawyer and of course um, a very senior person in that field that we all looked up to. Mm. So he called me and said, yeah, Randy, I've been um, listening to you. I've been watching you, uh, you, you do a lot and all that. So he asked me about uh, my academy. That's what I mean, after my national service. I've... Then he told me that, look, um, talent can take you here. This mm. is exactly what he did. So he pointed to your neck, the lower part of his, uh, yeah, mm. the upper part of his neck, mm. and said that, look, talent can take you here. But the skill that mm. will take you, then he took his hand up, up above his head, mm. go to school. Wow. You know, and I, I promised him that the day I do a personality profile, I will you let put the his whole name world in know. There. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so Moses Wawedi wow. said that to me, mm. you know, and in the course of thing, I meet people, I interview people, I interact with people, and then when they find out that I had not done uni, uh, they, 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 they step back yeah, a little. They're like, mm. ah, really? Mm. You know? Yeah. And so along the line, you know these things, ah, do I go to school and go and do all these things? The fame had started and all that. So you find some short course, you try and go and do it and all that. Until I just decided that, look, uh, you would have to go to school. My mother, my grandmother, I owe it to them. I, I, I mean, they deserve it. They, wow. This is what they wanted me uh, to do, I need to challenge myself, and uh, for 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 deciding to go against them and all that, I think that I needed to also punish myself in mm, mm, by mm. going through what I, I should have done mm. uh, then uh, as an adult. Uh, now, so I decided to do it. So you went to Gimpa. So so yes, Gimpa mm. was 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 around the uh, the line, and even at Gimpa, I I went to do a short program in HR, you know. Uh -huh. Then I started looking for schools. You know, I remember, I don't know if you know Ola Mangote. Maybe you've heard the name, Ola. Yes, yes, yes sure. Right chat, mm. even told me that, oh, do you know that if you put all your programs together mm. and you send them, you could even get a, 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 a degree or something. So he kept telling me those things. He's, he's also somebody who loves to speak about education mm. and all that. So I started applying for schools, applying to schools, mm. you know. And all. then I had um, a school in uh, Switzerland that decided to give me an ME, a master's program. I mean, in lieu of uh, a first degree on the basis of my management experience and all the things that I've done. Um, but I was supposed to do it online. So I'd even paid the first part of the fees I'd been enrolled. Then I, dis I realized that, look, this online thing and all that, it was, it was boring. Yeah. I mean, to come sit by the computer every day and all that, mm. I, I, I mean, I just couldn't, couldn't do it. Mm. And then I realized that I was more of a, an interactive 
kind of person. I need to be in the space yes. where right. there can be an interaction. I can ask questions. Practical experiences can be shared. I can deal with people. So I was just sitting behind the computer was not my thing. You know, so I then continue with it. Mm. You know, and until three years ago, they would always send me an email reminding me that I had school fees to pay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this I was not interested is 3FM. in the fact that I had not read the, the exam. So mm. then I saw the Australian Institute of Business, you know, uh, and that they had a learning center here. This should be around 2015. Mm. So then I'd done a lot of professional courses, other courses, and all that, but nothing academic. So. I then decided to read about it. I think I saw it in a daily graphic. Mm. I gave them a call. They had, they had a learning center here. Um, and uh, now the Accra Business School, they were doing like the lectures here. Mm. So they sent some people to come meet me. And then they took me through it. Then they took my CV and everything. Uh, they made me fill the forms. They sent them to Australia and said, well, let's wait. So I was there, I had a call after about uh, some three weeks. That there's an email from Australia. Um, I've been enrolled, you know, uh, I've been admitted to do the MBA. You were not interested in the Ghanaian schools? Ah, uh, it, it wasn't an issue of not being interested. I was just looking, okay. you know, for, okay. for something. And I also was not interested in something that was going to take me outside completely. Mm. Uh, so this was a, this, these ones were a bit flexible. Mm. I could be here mm -hmm. and do it. I would have the lecture opportunities. Um, the British Council was going to administer the exams, you know, on behalf of the Australian Institute of Business and all that. And then I could go do my graduation. Um, in there. Australia? Yes, yeah. in Australia. Mm. So I did it. And I also liked how it was modeled. And it was in such a way that if you did a 12 in 12, so there was like um, uh, one module every month. And so if you could do the 11 and the project, the 12, if you did, if passed all consec consecutively, mm. you, you would end up with a postgraduate certificate, a postgraduate diploma before the MBA, mm. you know? And um, by the special grace of God, I did a 12 and 12. So I ended up not just with an MBA, but three uh, postgraduate degrees. Wow. Yes. Wow. In one swoop. Wow. You know? Wow. <laughs> so, wow. So that then happened. Mm. And then after that, then I also saw the um, SBS Swiss Business School mm -hmm. doctoral program as well. Mm -hmm. And so then I applied with the MBA and I got that as well. How many years did it take you to get your PhD? Okay, so we we're supposed to do a minimum of three years. Mm. A minimum of three years. Mm. And so I should, my third year was going to be 2020. Mm. 2020 was an election year. Mm. You know, and knowing what I do, mm. obviously I could not combine it. So mm. I went to my professor, you know, and um, I went to him and I told him that, oh, well, uh, Prof, uh, Prof Jima, Jima, I told him that oh, he's the number two innovation scholar in the world. Wow. He set up the Nobel International Business School. Oh, wow. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. yes, yes. Mm. And he was my professor. And uh, he's even the reason for my topic. So, so my thesis was on uh, um, CSR uh, fulfillment uh, and innovation performance. So I wanted to see how, you know, um, CSR fulfillment could impact on innovation performance. And mm. I chose the service sector in Ghana mm. because that was the largest contributor to GDP and the biggest employer, mm. you know, and there was little or no studying to that area in Africa. Mm. And even for North America and Europe, many of the people who had done earlier, done earlier studies had, had, had made the point that um, it was an area that should be explored right. further. Mm. And so um, I decided to do that. So I went to him and I said, Prof, uh, this thing, if I move into 2020, I would have to defer. Mm. And if I defer, knowing myself, I'm not sure I'm going to come back. Mm. Then mm. he said, okay, um, give me some time, let me check. So he calls me back a couple of days and says that, look, I've checked with the Swiss authorities. And the Swiss law, you can finish in 24 months, two years. Wow. It's up to you. Mm. I will be here to help you, mm. but it's up to you. Mm. If you are able to work extremely hard, mm. you can do it. So the ball is in your court. Wow. So I said, okay, prof, I accept the challenge. And so I decided, because I knew that once I moved into that election year, 
there was no way I was going to combine it. Wow. And so Prof helped me and um, um, many of the research assistants and others. And mm. so uh, push, push, pushed. And by the grace of God, mm. I was able to, to do it. Mm. And um, my thesis, I had my public defense. Uh, my thesis was approved. Mm. And I was able to graduate in 2019. So mm. I did a doctorate in two years. Wow. Yes. Wow, congratulations. Thank you very so much. So you are a doctor right now, Dr. <laughs> Randy Wilson. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so getting to know you right from your background, your education, we're going to go into serious conversations right now. Um, I'm told that you used to be with the NPP. Have you switched? No, I've, I've, I've never been a, a member of a, wow. the NPP. I've never wow. been a member of a political party. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. I, I as a... President Kufo liked me a lot. Oh, wow. I, he was somebody that I, I admired and I still admire him. Mm. I still consider him as a dad. He's somebody who I have enormous respect for. Mm. Yes, and so we had a very good relationship, an excellent relationship. I mean, uh, even the current president mm. had a, a very good relationship with him. Many, many, many mm. people, many friends in there. Yes, but um, I've never been a member mm. of uh, uh, the party. Yes. All right. So, I mean, um, a lot of people think that you have a lot of sympathies for the NDC. Uh, what's your relationship with the NDC? Um, I am not a member mm. of uh, the NDC. Are you an admirer? <laughs> okay. I have a relationship mm. with um, President John Mahama. Oh, okay, and the former a, president. Yes, mm. it's a relationship that dates way back. Mm. I have an um, excellent relationship with many people in the NDC. Uh, in, the, in the course of my work, I mean, I've done this thing for close to 30 years. And so, I mean, I've developed a lot of relationships, um, on, I mean, on all sides. Mm. Um, with the issue of uh, President Mahama, it's more like a family. You know, he's like a big brother uh, to me. Mm. Um, and uh, Ibrahim Mahama, who's his younger brother, as, um, like my mate, we've been friends from 1987. Wow! So that's how long um, I've known them. So that's like my family. Mm. I hope mm. you understand what I'm saying. Yes, that's yes. right. And um, I have a lot of very close um, family members uh, and, and and all that. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. Did you vote for him the last ele election? Yes, I did. And you would vote for him again these elections? I believe so. Um, do you do you think that Nana Akufuado hasn't done well? and therefore Mahama needs to come back? I think so. What do you think Nana Akufuado hasn't done well? Well, I, I think that in the area of the, the economy, mm. I think that uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, we are not where um, we should be. You know, we, we should have done much, much better. Mm. And um, um, if I analyze the situation, I think that... Um, we, ca we could have been a lot more, um, a lot more transparent. Mm. Uh, mm. We could have opened up a lot more. I think that uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, the kind of honesty we need in in in, in running things and in, in in letting people appreciate what is happening mm -hmm. has not been there. I think that we could have done much, 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 much better. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a, a lot of lost opportunities. Did you think that he was going to do better than Mahama in the last two elections where Mahama was replaced? So, um, if you follow the if you follow the narrative on the Ghanaian economy, especially 2015, 2016, mm. you would realize that a lot of the forecasts was pointing to the Ghanaian economy doing, picking up in 2017, doing very well, posting some very positive results. What it meant was that anybody who took over uh, would take over an economy in 2017, would take over an economy which was relatively much better and more stable than uh, 2015 and 2016. So what it meant was that you had uh, quite a solid platform upon which to build and, and do much better. And so I expected that, I mean, whoever took over was going to do much better. And so I wasn't too surprised with some of the... Um, the, the Successes of the government. The, yes, mm. that, we, we, that, that we churned out in 2017, 2018, 2019. Mm. Don't forget that we also, we had inherited an IMF program and we're continuing on that uh, tandem. 
Yes, and then you know that uh, President Kufuado had been speaking about the Gorgesberg economy and had promised that uh, we're going to have uh, a clear departure from that mm. and that um, it is a structure of the economy which really was um, uh, what was um, the Achilles heel as far as the Ghanaian economy was concerned. And so that was going to change. And if you, you read the budgets and the narrative from the finance minister and the president 2017, 2018, right. early 2019, the impression that was even created was that uh, the structure had changed. We were now, our economy was now more formidable and that we had enough shocks and we had changed a lot of things. I mean, issues of taxation to production, industrialization and all those things had come in. Mm. And the issue of the structure of the economy had become topical because it appeared that if you look at the, the, the history of the Ghanaian economy, anytime there are some headwinds, we are swept aside. And it is always traced to the structure of the economy, the kind of economy that we... And that is why President Kufaru kept referring to it as a Gorgesberg economy. As to wait, I mean, an economy we had inherited from, uh, you know, colonial uh, 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 people, and we had not done anything about it. It's, right. it's just the mm -hmm. raw material-based yeah. economy, yeah. and we had not done anything to industrialize and add value and all those things. So we're not earning enough, and any time that there were some global shocks were swept aside. Then we had COVID. And then our real strength began to show. And whether we indeed had diversified and we had put in place the structures to move from a Gorgesberg economy to a new economy was now fully exposed, you know. And um, of course, um, we're still in a tailspin. Um, and, and, and we all know where we are at the moment. Right. Yes. Certainly, we all know where we are right now. Do you think that you've succeeded with moving the economy from the Gojisberg economy to the Nkrumah economy? Have they been able to do that? To do what? To move it in terms of the one district, one factory. Mm. All these things were supposed to help nothing with the... Ha nothing has happened. Because, you see, um, I say that um, in Ghana, we like to do um, a quantitative analysis instead of a qualitative analysis. And I always um, use this as an example. Uh, somebody says that oh, somebody built 10 factories. I have built 100 factories, so I'm better than the 10. Yes. What we don't look at is the impact of the 10 factories and the impact of the 100 factories. Mm. For example, 10 Picanto vehicles mm. are 10 cars. Mm. One Mercedes S600 mm. is one car. Mm. So it's like saying that, oh, I own uh, 10 Picanto vehicles. You own one Mercedes S600. Mm. I am better than you because I have 10 cars. You have one car. Yes. Mm. That's the kind of argument that we make. Mm. And I always say that if you take, let's say, one industrial establishment. Right. So I want to use the, um, uh, the gas plant. Mm. Okay. If you take the gas plant, it takes care of about 40% of our LPG requirements as a nation. That saves us about $300 million every year. Mm. That's one. Mm. Mm. So if we're speaking about X number of factories, mm. You do these things, you industrialize. One of the things is to deal with import substitution. It's also to create jobs. It's also to deal with the issue of Forex. You, you understand me? So you should be saying that, okay, in embarking in this industrialization drive, mm. we have been able to create one X number of jobs. Mm. That's for job creation. Mm. But most importantly, we were importing maybe X bags of sugar. With this intervention, the importation has reduced to B. We were doing Y rice, it's reduced to this. We're doing processed tomatoes, it's reduced to that. We're doing vegetable oil, it's reduced to that. We were spending maybe $500 million to bring in uh, rice or poultry products. As a result of this intervention, it's reduced to this. That's the whole import about 
industrializing. Right. You know, so for me, it is not about counting the number of things that have been set up. If you do that count without relating it to how it has impacted the impact, right, on mm. the economy, mm. it is it is it is a quantitative analysis analysis that That's leads right. us nowhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope you understand the point yeah. I'm making. Yes, I yes. Do. So it is not just about saying that X number of factories have been set up. We are setting up the factories for a certain impact, for a certain effect. Mm. So we should be told about what that effect is. Mm. I hope mm. you understand what I'm saying. Mm. How mm. it has affected, I mean, the basis for which we did those things. Mm. What has been the impact? Mm. That's what we need to know. So mm. if we say that, oh, well, we did it for job creation. Mm. And it has reduced unemployment by this, that we mm. understand. Mm. If we say that it was to change the structure of the economy, so we're going to industrialize in order to add value. Mm. And if we add value, then we must see um, a drive in our imports and therefore our receipts in imports. And we must see maybe a reduction in the, in the a, a drive in our exports, sorry, and then our receipts from exports. And then obviously must also result in a, a, a reduction in our imports. Mm. So we should be able to see that, oh, well, this thing we did has led to a reduction in A, B, C, D. That's right. It's led to an appreciation in X, Y, Z. Sure. That's how we ought to analyze it. That's how we'll be able to know that this is how it has impacted the economy. Qualitatively. That is why mm. I gave the example, and I always give the example of the gas processing plant. Yes. Yes. It's right. no rocket science. You can mm. tell mm. that you were importing X LPG gas. Mm. You spent one billion on this factory mm. every year, it's saving you three hundred mm. million. Mm. Over a three-year cycle, three and a half-year cycle, it pays mm. for itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. So you can tell the impact directly. Mm. So I, I, for example, say that if we had spent maybe all our energies mm. in getting maybe a hundred thousand um, um, uh, uh, barrel a day mm. refinery. Mm. We do importation of uh, finished products, about uh, some $300, $350 million right. um, every month. Mm. Now, it is because almost everything is imported. Mm. So if you had, let's say, 100,000 barrel a day refinery operating, what it means is that all this $350 million that the uh, BDCs mm. look for to import finished products, mm you would have to stop that. Yes. Because then you would have set up that refinery here mm -hmm. and you will not be looking for that. Yeah, to deal with that. Yes. Refinery. And so this if you made that intervention, FM. then you can directly say that, look, by building this 100,000 barrel a day refinery, we have uh, saved this country, uh, this $350 million that we have to look for every month in order to bring in petroleum products. Interesting. Do you get the point yeah, I'm making? Right, yes. So right. anytime we speak about industrialization drives and number of factories and what we've done. This is how we need to analyze it. Yes. But without that and just mm. giving a list of, of, factories, uh, of, built. of factories built, without I mean, looking at the impact, that really is it's uh, problematic. Yes. It's, yes. It's, it doesn't take us anywhere. Would you accept um, a political appointment in this government? Let's say if this government comes and say, oh, this is a brilliant young man, you know, we want him to be part of this government. Would you accept <laughs> it's it? Too it's too late. late. It's too late. Mm. <laughs> it's too late. It's too late. If it had been a little earlier, would you have accepted it like well, two I years back? I don't know. I would have taken the decision based on circumstances. Circumstances. Yes. But circumstances. It's, 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 it's too late. And, and um, I, I think that um, as far as the government is concerned, I mean, they, they believe that they have uh, the men. more than... Uh, more than enough men to do the work. So I'm not sure that uh, anybody will even think of, of that. Yes. So you will not accept it? No. Okay. How about the next government? Let's say mm. Mahama comes in and he offers you an appointment. Which one mm. would you prefer? <laughs> you know, I, I would always take decisions on the basis of the circumstances. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. Uh -huh. And so... Um, I, I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not gifted <laughs> with prophecy. And so I'm unable to deal with these things. But at any point in time, when any of these things come up, I obviously would have to think deeply about them. I have to analyze them. I have to look at what the situation is. I have to look at my personal capabilities. I have to look at 
whether it is a, an environment conducive enough for me to uh, uh, serve. And um, I'll take all those things into consideration and decide whether it's something worth pursuing or not. I understand that. Yes. We have about 15 more minutes to go. I'm going to make it very snappy. Mm. Um, you have the Good Morning Ghana show, which is a very, very beautiful one. A lot of people watch it and a lot of people have a lot of inf information from the it trends every now and then. Mm. Then there's another one which is Good Evening Ghana. I mean, even if you don't want to compare them mm. because they both have the good in it, one has the morning and one has the evening, you might say that, well, you might want to do some comparison here, here and there. Are you embarrassed at the way your colleague, um, um, Paul Adumotri, sometimes defends things that some people think are not supposed to be defended? These are, I mean, just things to uh, bootleg the government in power. Do you get embarrassed sometimes? Well, so it will, it will surprise you to note that... Mm because of my show i sleep very early and so i don't watch and so i do not remember the last time that i watched my brother and friend paul's show this is of course i read a lot of commentary about it uh don't forget that good evening ghana has been around for about 23 23 years or so um it's a very strong brand it's been around uh, for a very long time. <clears throat> but um, I read commentaries. Sometimes I see some videos. I see what people write um, about the show and all that. But I'm unable to do a content analysis because I am unable to, to watch the time that is aired. I'm sleeping, you know, around that time because I need to be up by 4 a.m., in order to get ready and come do good morning myself. Have you had an yes. occasion to speak with him and say, hey, uh, Paul, I think that you didn't go right here or that I think that you should have handled it like this? I would, I would do that if I watched. You understand me? Even in my football club, I will only have a, a conversation with my coach if I attend training and I watch the games. I watch the training session, I watch the games. Then I'll analyze with you. I don't do that on the basis of what... Um, I, I hear. Okay. Yes. All right. I but if that. if mm. I were to mm. to analyze and I feel that there's something to discuss with him, I will. Um, I'm sure that um, he probably will do the same too. That is fair. Yeah. But has he called you to talk about your show before? No. no. Never. No. Interest. Are you on good terms? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. All right. So I'm going to leave it here. But now I'm going to go to your boss. Your boss is Mr. Sion. Mm. And he is the boss of Zoom Lion. A lot of people have talked about him. Somebody like Manasseh Azure thinks that he's utterly corrupt. Mm. Just like my former boss, um, Nanapia Mensa, a.k.a. Nam one that people think that he's corrupt. Some people. Mm. Do you get embarrassed sometimes working for a boss who people think is corrupt in one way or the other? Well, I'm embarrassed. Um, no, and I'm sure that you, you're, you're speaking about boss... With respect to the fact that he owns the TV station and the brand. Okay, so so Metro TV um, is owned by Media TV, which is owned by him, and then G GBC. Mm. Okay, yes. Yeah, so um, uh, and this this happened in 2017. You know, I have been associated with this brand from 2001, and yes, um, I'm I'm not unaware of um, all the controversies around uh, the operations of some of his companies. You know, I'm not aware of that. I, I'm not unaware, unaware yeah, right. um, mm. of those things. And obviously, I mean, there will be a cause for, for concern. And nobody wants uh, um, any, any bad or terrible image, you know. And so um, my relationship with him really has to do with the, the business, the running um, of the business, and, and that is what we discuss. And, and for me, uh, that's it. Not about his personal activities? No, no. I'm, mm. not, I'm not responsible for his personal activities. You don't mind if he's paying you with corrupt money? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that he's paying me with corrupt money. I'm okay. not sure about that. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, all right. Sure well, it's fair. It's fair. All right. So, I mean, this is Randy Wilson. I almost said Randy Wilson. Randy Wilson <laughs> was my mentor way back at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Right. Randy, if you are listening, big up yourself. He you taught me something I will never forget. Mm. And uh, I've always said it, you know, anytime I have an opportunity. This is the great Randy Abbey. Mm. We're having a beautiful conversation. Now, we're going to move from there. And I will mm. ask you again, GFA, do yes. you want to be the president? No. Never. Not today, not tomorrow. Not today, not tomorrow. Keto Kreku, is he going to win? Uh, I, I think that is in poor position to retain his, his, uh, his, his position. Do you miss Nyantechi? Do you think that he should have still been uh, on? Well, I think that he did his bit and he's moved on. And we need to look uh, forward. Were you disappointed that he was caught on tape saying all those things about the president in his pocket and taking money and all that? Were you? I mean, uh, you would not want um, uh, you would not want him to go um, off with such negativity. So obviously, respective of everything, as human beings and as somebody who you've uh, worked with before. I mean, that's not how you would want him to, to sign off or to, to leave the space. And so it was quite um, um, unfortunate and disheartening. Do you want him back? Oh, like I said, I think that he's played his bit uh, and, and he's moved on. I think there's a new era we need to, to, to look forward and move on. Randy Abbey mm -hmm. is my guest. We are still talking. We have more interesting things to talk about. This is 3FM. All right. So, I mean, presently, you are the owner of a very prestigious football club, and that is Pando Hearts of Lions. Mm. Where do you want to take this club to? Oh, as, um, we, we, we want to build um, a very successful brand. Mm. Yes, we want to build a very successful brand, a brand that gives a lot of opportunities um, uh, for our talented uh, young men and um, 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 soon women as well, you know. And by doing that, uh, we also want to create value as far as uh, for us the shareholders are concerned. And we want to do um, something for, for Pando, for Volta, uh, something that really uh, will stand the test of time and, and will be, like I said, a very, very successful brand. We want to be, we want to create a lot of opportunities. This country um, abounds with talent, especially when it comes to football. I want to be one um, of the brands that will, will give a lot of opportunities for these persons and create a lot of value for all of us. Five minutes for us to leave. Mm -hmm. Mahama becomes the next president mm -hmm. uh, after a strong comeback. It looks like everybody's crying that Mahama needs to come back. People are crying. People want to see Nana Akufuado out. First and foremost, let me ask this question. Do you think that there will be a coup d'etat in Ghana? No. Really? Yes. First of all, I don't want. Mm. And I will pray against. Nice. And um, I would... Um, I would... I would really, 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 for the life of me, not want that to happen. And I'm saying this being mindful of the replications of coup d'etat. Right. Um, for people like me, we've lived through it. Mm. And so it's, I'm not somebody who read it in history books. I experienced it, you know, and so I would not want that. Mm. However, I need to sound a note of caution. And I keep making this point on television that we ought to stop, you know, with that notion of, oh, coups are not good, we know coups are not good, and nobody wants coups, and use that as an excuse. To misbehave. To misbehave. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. We should stop that. Mm. You know, uh, there's something, this there's is an expression in English that don't tempt fit. Mm. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yes. And so we don't have to be complacent. Mm. And I, what I say also is that it is important that all of us, mm. you know, whether you are in power or not in power, whether you are apolitical or political, we all have friends. We all have relationships. We are either in church together, we went to school together, we are friends, we have social relationships, and all those things. It doesn't matter whether we are in the same, same partisan space or not. But you see, to the extent that when this country degenerates, it will affect everybody. It is incumbent on us to look ourselves in the face and say that, hey, my brother, what you're doing, my brothers and sisters, what you're doing can harm us collectively. Mm. 
We should be able to do that. Mm. We should be able. And all what we are expected to do is to provide hope. Hope which is founded on something, on mm. substance. Mm. To the teeming young people. Mm. My Archbishop uh, Nicholas Duncan Williams is famed to have said, uh, commented about um, a nation that has a growing army of people who have nothing to lose. Mm. And mm. we keep growing a large army of these persons. Mm. And it is scary. And we need to be able to look ourselves in the face and be truthful to ourselves. That look, when we have the opportunity, we need to act in ways. We need to use the state's resources. Mm. We need to use the power, the comfort, the perks, the, the, the authority and the influence that is given to us to better the lives of our people, to offer concrete, substantial hope and opportunities to our people. They should be able to wake up and believe that if they are able to play their part, those in charge of the um, 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 those in charge of this country will be able to provide, you know, that kind of opportunities for them. And we need to be able to tell ourselves that truth because touch wood and God forbid, if something happens, it will go for all of us. Yeah, true. It will go for all of us. That's true. So we have a responsibility whether we are actively involved mm -hmm. or we are not the ones involved. That's true. To be able to have that conversation amongst ourselves mm. and say that it doesn't matter whether you are in there today and somebody else is outside. If it goes bust, it takes everybody else. Yes, very true. And so let's endeavor mm. to do what is right by our people. Do and you, it's extremely important. Do you think the government is misbehaving, though? Well, uh, I, I don't know what you mean by misbehaving. Misbehavior as in uh, things that can bring about a coup. You know, I think that there is a growing level of... Misbehavior. Frustration. Mm. And, and despondency. Mm. You know, mm. and, and hopelessness. Mm. And those are things that... Um, do not inure to the benefit of a country. And can bring about a coup. And, and so we mm. ought to stop these things in their tracks. Mm. We need to, 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 to try and reverse some of these things. Are you looking at Cecilia Dapa? The huge sums of money stashed out both in the bedrooms and also in the bank account. Well, yes, the optics are not good. Mm. But I think that our issues go way, way beyond... Um, that, but optics like that, obviously, I um, mean, aren't good, you know. But you know, occurrences like that just go to to support a certain viewpoint. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, but I think that the issues are bigger. You know, they are bigger than that. Interesting. Mm. Finally, in fact, I have 600 questions to ask you. Unfortunately, uh, we may have to run away. We That's have just more than 170. <laughs> <laughs> one more question and we are done yes. in fact imagine you were in this country with just two people to choose from to be president Baumia and Kennedy Japan who would you go for you must choose one <laughs> I'll pass it <laughs> this is 3FM you pass it yes you would prefer a presidentless country. <laughs> this is 3FM. Wow. You don't admire I Dr. Dr. B, good afternoon. <laughs> That's how I used to call the vice president. Dr. B. Dr. B. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So Randy Abbey will pass it on. In fact, he would certainly want to have a presidentless country if it's all about Baumia <laughs> and Kennedy and Japan. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And in fact, you've made me really proud. I didn't know that you'd be able to make it. And I thank so much. I want thank to play you. you any reggae song of your choice. Ah. Uh. You know, when I got into the studio and you were playing all that kind of music, I thought I was at the wrong place because, you know, the impression I had was that you play only reggae. Only reggae, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Until we get into the African history class. Oh, okay. I yes. didn't know that you played anything, Yes. Uh, you know, um, um, apart from reggae. So it's I was surprised reggae. when you were playing yes. um, all those songs yes. and, 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 and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, you know, 
Um, I love Bob Marley. Bob? Wow. Yes, the king Bob himself. Marley. Which one of his songs? I love, I love Bob Marley. And um, um, almost all his songs. But I, I love Redemption songs. Redemption? Yes. Do you want the fast one or the slow one? Uh, the slow one sings better. Ah, yes. wow. Yes. The slow one. Okay, yes. so I'm going to play that.